Hi, I'm Ernie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and it's June 5th, Sunday. I wanted to talk to you today about emergency planning. Now, emergency plans are kind of unique to nuclear power plants. Coal plants don't have them, oil plants don't have them, windmills and solar farms don't need them either. Way back when nuclear regulations were started, the, um, the people recognized that nuclear plants were different and there would be a need to evacuate lots of people in the event of a, uh, of a nuclear accident. So they came up with a law to implement those concerns. So there's a thing called the Code of Federal Regulations. Now every agency has their own Code of Federal Regulations and the nuclear one is part 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations. So 10 CFR is nuclear law. Within that is a part 100, and part 100 talks about how to site a nuclear plant. And within that is a chapter 11 that talks about emergency planning. Now, so it's 10 CFR, nuclear law, 111 is what we're gonna talk about today. That law says real, really simply that there's only one criteria for emergency planning, and that's that nobody in the population get more than 25 rem of radiation during the course of a nuclear accident. That's how the law is written. That's the number, that's the goal that the uh, utilities must stay below. Now, Chairman Yasko has said that uh, he's confident that 10 mile plans are adequate, and yet in Japan, Chairman Yasko recommended to the White House to evacuate out to 50 miles, but there's no basis in the law, in 10 CFR, to discuss what that distance is. It's just whatever it takes to stay below 25 rem of radiation. So now then, Congress then told the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that they have to come up with a way to calculate that exposure. And this is where it gets interesting. The law is clear, 25 rem is the most somebody can get, but it's based on a lot of speculation about what is released from a nuclear power plant. Now all that speculation is put into something called a new reg, and that's a regulation that implements the bigger law. There's two new regs that apply, new reg 0654 and new reg 0396 are the two. But anyway, they're just a compilation of all of the speculation that the Nuclear, Regula Nuclear Regulatory Commission assumes when they try to implement 10 CFR 100. Now let's talk about how this 10 mile zone came to be. The NRC was allowed to make some assumptions about how much radiation got out of a nuclear power plant. It's just speculation. The NRC and the industry got together and they said, well, let's speculate that 1% of the nuclear fuel fails in the event of an accident. And of that 1%, let's speculate that 95% of that gets stuck on the inside of all of the containment boundaries that are inside there. And so of the 1%, and we've taken 95% of that, now that all of the remainder is inside the nuclear containment, and the NRC says, well, let's assume that the containment then leaks at a half a percent per day. So the speculation that only 1% of the fuel fails and that 95% of that gets stuck on the walls, and that then only a half a percent of what it remains is released every day, is the basis that the nuclear industry and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission come up with when they de determine the emergency planning zones around a nuclear reactor. When you apply all those assumptions, you come up with a very small emergency planning zone, a couple miles. So the NRC said, well, let's go out to 10 miles. And that's in New Reg um, 0396. And it appears as an assumption in a regulation, but it's really not part of 
nuclear law. And it's based on a whole series of speculations that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the nuclear industry agreed to. Well, Fukushima shows us that all of those assumptions went up in smoke, quite literally, on March 11th. We know that all of the fuel failed, not 1%. We know that the containment leaked like a sieve. So the speculation that was nuclear regulation on March the 10th really has no basis in fact since March 11th. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission makes a bunch of speculation and they determine that there's no way anybody outside of 10 miles is ever going to receive an excess amount of radiation. Now then, they have to develop a written evacuation plan for people inside that 10-mile zone. And here's what that written plan uh, speculates. According to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, school bus drivers who have families outside the 10-mile zone will leave their families, hop in the school bus, and drive into the nuclear accident to evacuate kids at the local high school. According to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, those school bus drivers will leave their families outside, drive into the accident to evacuate elders in elder housing. According to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, parents won't drive to school to rescue their kids. They'll drive away from the nuclear accident and wait for the school buses to come to them. Now, it's actually a little worse than that because the most likely type of a nuclear accident is caused by a loss of off-site power. That's what happened at Fukushima. The power system around the plant broke down. Well, if that happens, not only will the plant not have power, but the streetlights won't work. According to the NRC, the streetlights do work. Not only that, but your home lighting won't work and your radio and TV won't work. But according to the NRC, you'll be able to contact the, the um, outside world by phones or by radio or by television. But remember, the most likely cause of a nuclear accident is loss of off-site power. And that's never been part of an emergency plan, assuming that all of that does not work. Well, Again, though, there's some other issues that need to be considered in addition, and that's infrastructure. That means highways, for instance. Let's look at Pilgrim for a minute. Pilgrim's at the base of Cape Cod, and if it has an accident and the wind is blowing like it was at Fukushima to the east, that's right across Cape Cod. But the emergency plan for Pilgrim tells people to stay in place on Cape Cod. Don't evacuate. So the radioactive winds are blowing toward them, but the emergency plan assumes they don't move. Now, anybody who's ever been to Cape Cod knows there's two bridges and they're always full of traffic. So the, the traffic problems, the infrastructure problems, will limit the ability to evacuate people in a real drill. Another plant with similar problems is Indian Point. Indian Point has two major highways heading north-south on one side of the plant, and the Hudson River on the other. So it's trapped in a river valley corridor where the radioactive plumes usually travel in the same direction, north-south. It's hard to imagine that people will drive rationally and not have a seven-car pileup on one of those highways slowing the evacuation down. But again, according to the NRC, every bit of traffic moves reasonably. Well, let's look a little further south in another infrastructure problem. Down in Florida, there's a plant called Turkey Point. It was um, almost hit by Hurricane Andrew uh, about 20 years ago. And afterward, infrastructure was destroyed around the power plant. The, um, the, the security systems didn't work. The radiation de detectors didn't work. The uh, highways were, were, uh, were a mess. And there's no way that it could have been evacuated. Had the, had the hurricane caused a, uh, an accident. On the opposite coast, we've got Diablo Canyon in California, which is right next to an earthquake fault. But according to the NRC, all of the bridges won't collapse in the earthquake and people will be able to drive away from the accident 
on bridges that miraculously withstand the earthquake when the power plant does not. So emergency planners at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and in the nuclear industry would like us to believe two things. That people behave rationally in an emergency and do what the plan was written to do. And that Mother Nature is benign and there's no damage to infrastructure. On March 10th, the day before Fukushima happened, if you had asked me who were the best people on the planet to be prepared in the event that an emergency happened, I would have said it was the Japanese. And yet, look, here we are three months later, and it's obvious that they were totally unprepared for the accident that, that actually occurred. Well, what I'm proposing here is, is not that we take a look at the law. This is a good law. And it says 25 rem, and that will protect the population. But what's more important is to look at all the speculation that goes into developing all that implementing stuff that goes behind this. It goes into, let's take a look. What did we learn from Fukushima about how much radiation can be released from an accident? What did we learn from Fukushima about the condition of the infrastructure after an accident? And take all of that and come up with better emergency planning. When I factor in all the things I just discussed, fuel failures, containment failures, winds that blow in more than one direction, irrational behavior, destroyed infrastructure, I reach the conclusion that the NRC needs to demand emergency plans out to 50 miles, not 10, just like the United States required in Japan. If it's good enough for Americans living in Japan, it's good enough for us back home. I'm sure it will be more expensive, but the goal of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission should be to protect us, not industry profits.